Welcome to the Gospel Liberty Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode. Hi. In this episode, we're going to be talking about unity of mind and how unity of mind comes from persuasion, not coercion or pretending or censorship. Hmm. There's many passages in scripture that talk about the importance of Christians having unity of mind. Mm -hmm. And let's look at a few here first before we get talking. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says, Finally, brothers, agree with one another. Philippians 2, 2, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4, 2 says, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 8 says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Mm-hmm. Romans twelve sixteen says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Now let's talk about first what these passages do not mean. Then we'll talk about what they do mean. So first, what it doesn't mean. In many churches and among many pastors, mostly the really egotistical ones who care about their own kingdoms and glory more than Christ's, they can twist these texts to try to stifle open discussion Hmm. and even friendly debate around the word among members of their churches. And I Hmm. don't only want to make this sound like churches only. This can happen in countries. It can happen in families or political parties, political parties in any organization where these folks just care about their own kingdoms and their own glory more than Christ. Mm -hmm. So they might say, well, the the Bible says we should have unity of mind. So therefore, you shouldn't talk about anything that that me or the elders disagree with because then you're causing division. Or if it's a husband, you shouldn't talk about anything that, that I disagree with. Or if it's a leader of an organization or whoever it is, or the leader of a country, Mm -hmm. you know, getting rid of freedom of speech, Mm -hmm. because that's going to cause division among the citizens, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a gross misunderstanding of what the Bible is actually saying when it says, agree with one another, Mm -hmm. or when it says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you don't attain unity of mind among a church or any organization by either trying to coerce people to agree with a doctrine you believe is biblical or by silencing people who disagree with you, mm-hmm. censoring them. Mm-hmm. Neither of those things create unity of mind. No, it, it just completely shuts up the other person and um, just fearfully forcing them to not speak or to not be themselves or to not freely study the word of God um, with others or what have you, um, it's just a toxic environment. Yeah, that's exactly right. It creates a culture of fear and it creates a cult of personality around a particular individual or an Mm -hmm. elder team or or a group of leaders rather than a healthy culture that's centered around Christ and his word. It's actually, it's the tactic of tyrants. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's so much more joy in the culture and in the workplace and in the family and the church when people can be free to be who they are in the Lord and to say what they really to say think. what they really think. Yep. I just think that that's such a sad thing when people just feel like they need to walk on eggshells in all of the areas that we already, you know, spoke to. That is very bad. That's not a good situation when you don't feel like you can just say whatever you th- are thinking. And yeah. again, you can be wrong. You could be not, you know, biblical right. in what you're saying, but then that can create more discussion yes. and that can stir on wonderful things yeah. for people to go to the word of God and to see what is truth yes. rather than just, yeah, feeling like, oh, you can't say anything because, you know, it might offend, you know, that person or, you know, the, you know, tyrant leader is right. going to bite their head off. Yep. Yep. Exactly. It's so true. Yeah. It's this, you know, censorship that we see in nations and, you know, it's even exists in churches. Mm-hmm. They, they try to create this unity by shutting off people's ability to learn new things. Yes. And, and, that, and it's just a false unity. It's, it's a not, false unity. It's not yeah. true yeah. unity yeah. because people are just shutting their mouths yeah. and they're not 
they're not speaking their true minds. Right. It's unity because you've created a culture of ignorance. Yes. And making people like little robots who will just, you know, feed whatever the propaganda machine is telling them and just eat that up and just repeat it out rather than actually thinking and actually getting to what is true and what is right. Just stifling study, you know, Um, just helping people or not helping people, just forcing them in a sense to, to not, to not learn and to not study. Yes. And and that's why the the first amendment of the U S constitution is, it was so influenced by the Christian culture hmm. that was the, the air that was breathed by the founding fathers of America because mm-hmm. Christianity is not a religion of coercion. Yes. We're going to get into that a little bit more in, in a bit. It's a, it's a religion, it's a faith that comes from heart change and mm-hmm. from mind change that is a willing mind change when someone is actually convinced by the Spirit of God and by the Scriptures and by mm-hmm. the other person who is arguing what is true and right according to the Word through uh, that that is how someone's mind is changed you you can't create unity of mind by coercion you you mm-hmm. can't force people to believe a certain thing mm-hmm. so i mean take the debate about whether or not god controls all things that come to pass whether or not he's in control of every single detail you you can't make someone believe that and if you silence people who disagree with your viewpoint and you forbid them to, to talk about it with others, that doesn't create unity of mind. Just like you said before, that's that false unity that's mm-hmm. built around ignorance or built around fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the whole cancel culture mm-hmm. is just slowly, slowly just creeping itself you know, into the church. Right. And, um, and that's just a dangerous thing. I think that everyone, you know, people and pastors and everyone included needs to be mindful of that to, um, fight against that, yes. um, to encourage communication and to encourage conversations, um, and encourage learning and studying the word of God and not just, you know, shutting someone up if they might have a slightly different view yes. or if they disagree with, you know, you yourself. Yeah. Encourage people to explore the different viewpoints Amen. rather than just, oh, I don't want this person to know what the what the other side teaches because then they might believe it. Mm-hmm. So you're just OK with just perpetually keeping someone in a state of ignorance. No, strength comes from knowing what the Bible says mm-hmm. and being able to, to have your faith in the truth of the Bible stand against opposition mm-hmm. who is going against you and who's trying to say, no, you're wrong. But no, you, you know what the Bible says. You've studied it mm-hmm. and you know what the truth is. Not just, oh, I believe this because I've never really even been exposed to something else. Mm-hmm. And th- th- so these texts do not encourage church members or anyone to just shut up and never talk about the Bible and never share their true thoughts with Hmm. others in the church for fear of causing disunity. Mm -hmm. Disunity is actually caused by two things. This is very important. Disunity is caused by two things, either not having unity of mind, meaning not actually believing the same thing on important things that will cause disunity, or an unbiblical attitude toward those with whom we have disagreements on secondary or tertiary matters. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. Disunity is caused by two things, either not having unity of mind, you don't actually believe the same thing on important things, or an unbiblical attitude toward those with whom we have disagreements on secondary or tertiary matters. So <laughs> there, there would be disunity in a church necessarily if, for example, if a group of people thought that women should be pastors, one group of people thinks that, that women should be pastors, and then another person or a group thinks that the Bible teaches that there shouldn't be women pastors. Mm-hmm. So that's an example of the first type. Mm-hmm. You have two different viewpoints on a key issue, and there is disunity there because there is two different viewpoints on a key issue. Or there would be disunity, for the second example, 
if a person in a church started bashing those who disagreed with him as mm -hmm. horrible people mm -hmm. and unbelievers because they didn't hold to the same viewpoint as him on whether or not Paul or Apollos or someone else wrote the book of Hebrews, something mm -hmm. tertiary, mm -hmm. way, way down the line of importance, and you start, you know, ripping on the other people. Mm -hmm. Those are things that cause disunity. Yes. Not just, you know, having a different viewpoint or allowing people to discuss different viewpoints. Yes. So then, well, what do these texts about unity of mind mean then? Well, the, the exhortation to have unity of mind is an exhortation to strive to actually agree on things. Hmm. It's a call to actually get into the word and to wrestle with the text together and pray that God would give you eyes to see the truth in his word properly so that you would unite together around the truth in the Bible. Amen. Yes, I mean, get like those Bereans. You study the word of God and and figure it out. Um, the, the Bible is very clear on so many things, and it's a beautiful thing to study and to work hard at uh, figuring out what is what the Bible actually what says. the Bible says. Yep, exactly. So unity of mind comes by persuasion according to the word, not coercion or pretending or silencing. Mm -hmm. So, so if a member of a church disagrees with an elder. The answer isn't for the member of the church to just shut up about it so that we can have unity of mind as a church. That isn't <laughs> unity of mind. That is not, no. The yes. answer would be for the member and the pastor to get together and to try to persuade one another of their viewpoint and humbly pray together that the Spirit hmm. would give them both eyes to see what is really there in the text. Amen. Amen. So to, to say it again, the call to have unity of mind is to actually have your minds united together by hmm. being fully persuaded by the Spirit through the Bible, hmm. right? Amen. I mean, th that just creates a relaxed, jo just very joyful, just loving culture. Um, Where the pursuit of truth is central, yes. not the pursuit of conformity to the mind of a man. And, and that's where God gets glory yes. is in the pursuit of the truth of God's word and to make him look like he is and Amen. he's magnificent. It's not just, you know, so that the pastor can, you know, feel like he has all this power, yes. you know, to build his own little kingdom and to, you know, make himself feel good. Um, but no, 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 no. He's trying to glorify himself and not glorify Christ. Yes. And, and this happens so much in, oh, in churches and, and we, we so keep often. mentioning churches and it's so, it's so true about churches, but this can also apply to, you know, civil governments. If it's some, you know, political leader who just thinks that he is the one who has all the answers and you have, you know, certain um, d uh, professed doctors who go on TV and mm -hmm. make themselves equivalent of science. If you disagree with me, you're disagreeing with the science hmm. as if you are the, you know, infallible one who has <laughs> all of the truth and exactly. people aren't free to, you know, explore or make arguments against what you're saying mm -hmm. or a husband or a father who's doing that in a family. Yeah. I was just going to say the family example, if you, you know, might disagree with someone, it's, um, you know, yeah, it keeps to study it or, you know, mm -hmm. study together, you know, have conversations calmly to, to work things out, um, and, you know, come to, you know, to unity. Yes. <laughs> and, and it does happen so often too, with tyrannical parents who do this to their children. Yes. Instead of, actually trying to learn what their children believe or what their children uh, think about something, they would just rather, I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And then you do that when the child is 10 years old and then 11 and then 15 and then 18. Mm -hmm. And then really what you've taught your child is just to keep everything suppressed. And then when mm -hmm. the child becomes an adult and leaves the house, then you don't even know who your child is because hmm. he was he wasn't free to share his true thoughts even if he disagreed with you because you were just going to bite his head off or you were just going to try to silence him and hmm. censor him as soon as possible just mm -hmm. you know shut him up and then now he's free and he you know you never got to wrestle with those things while hmm. he was in your house mm -hmm. you never got to hear what his thoughts were and you never got to kindly you know, go back and try to persuade him and have these discussions. He just gave up because you kept uh, trying to sh uh, shut him down and then he left and he's gone. Yes. Uh, yeah. A beautiful example of a culture of fear versus a culture of grace. Yes. Yep. 
Exactly. So Christianity, it's not a religion of compulsion. I said that before, and I'll say it again. It, it's a religion of conversion and free persuasion. Hmm. So b- being a Christian starts with what's going on in the heart mm-hmm. and mind and what or who is being trusted in and what is being believed. So what, what did Paul say in Second Corinthians 5.11? He said, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Or in Acts 18.4, he went to the synagogue and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Mm -hmm. He reasoned with the people and tried to convince them to believe the truth. Hmm. He says in Romans 14.14 that he was persuaded in the Lord Jesus of a certain teaching. He he didn't just teach something or say he believed something that he didn't really believe Hmm. just to keep the peace. Yes. But, But then what about Titus 1, 10 through 11? Does that contradict what I'm saying? Maybe some of you don't know this text. It says, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. I actually had someone use this as an argument to, um, against what I was saying here one time. Um, so the, the, this text it does not at all contradict what I'm saying. These here are false teachers. They're false teachers teaching a different gospel. Hmm. And when it says they're insubordinate, it isn't talking about being insubordinate to a tyrannical pastor who tries to create a false unity of mind by keeping people in his church ignorant Mm -hmm. of other doctrinal viewpoints or silencing and censoring those who disagree with him on Mm -hmm. anything and not allowing for open discussion around the Bible. These false teachers in this verse we're being insubordinate to God's word, hmm. the Bible, and the truth of the gospel. So, so these heretical false teachers were to be silenced. But even this word, silenced, is only used this one time in the New Testament. And, and what is it saying exactly? It doesn't say, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say how these false teachers are to be silenced. Mm-hmm. So how, how are they to be silenced? Is it through putting duct tape over their mouths? Is that how they're to be silenced? <laughs> or is it by removing them from the physical presence of the church or is it to silence them by reasoning and argumentation hmm. well look two verses later titus 1 13 two verses later seems to suggest that the way that they were to be silenced was through being rebuked so through words of argumentation hmm. that the text says therefore rebuke them sharply So it seems like this silencing, even of these false teachers who were teaching a different gospel, was still done through trying to persuade them of their error and calling out their error Mm -hmm. through a rebuke. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how 2 Corinthians 10.5 talks about destroying arguments. It doesn't just say that you should just forbid the other people from from talking. You actually engage with the argument and destroy the argument. Or uh, 1 Peter 2.15, interestingly, it says that we silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. So there's a silencing that isn't about literally forcing someone to not speak. No. The the text has nothing to do with forcing a false unity of mind among church members by making sure they live in a bubble Mm -hmm. and are never exposed to other doctrines on secondary or tertiary matters and making sure that people never talk about secondary or tertiary things that disagree with a stated viewpoint. So in my view, that is a very, very uh, weak argument, and it is um, it doesn't hold up to exegesis and doesn't hold up to the context of what I'm even talking about uh, either, because I'm not talking about um, speaking false gospels, and also there's a way to silence someone without cutting off their ability to communicate. Yeah, and I, and I also think that, you know, everyone, we, everyone has to remember, you know, the Lord will keep his sheep. Amen. The Lord will keep his sheep. Like Very he good. is the sovereign one. He knows what he's doing. And whether there, you know, be a false teacher in a church or, I mean, or, you know, but, or just someone is saying something that isn't true in your family or, you know, in the government yes. or whatever the situation you is. You don't have to freak out. You don't have to freak out. The yeah. Lord, it, he is the sovereign one. He knows what he's doing. And, you know, specifically back to the church situation too, uh, you know, the people you know, the congregation should love to converse with each other. Yes. 
And also the pastors should be even more, even more pumped out of their minds to communicate with those people yes. who, you know, disagree with them or, you yeah. know, disagree to try with, to persuade them. Exactly. And again, that's, you know, one of, that can be, that is one of their main roles oh, is amen. to, that's a part of shepherding the flock. And that's a part of, you know, communicating with, you know, with the people and not just, Oh, great. Now I have another meeting to go to, or, oh, now I have to go and have coffee with someone else. And, oh, now I have to speak with this couple right. because they brought up this thing. And now I have to go to this mm-hmm. family because now this family is thinking it. Um, but they should be so excited so and excited. just praising the Lord that they get to go study yep. God's word with his people. Amen. And it should be a joyful thing. Try and to patiently help your people. Amen. And, teach them. and yet I think so many pastors specifically are lazy and they don't want to do that because because, oh, it, quote, creates more work right. um, yep. rather than, you know, because they just want to study and, you know, study yep. and you know, prepare for their sermons and, you know, Relax. do administrative yep. things and do other things for their, quote, job. Right. Um, so I think that's um, just saddening. That, that, that's such a great point. They don't see that as the central uh, reason why they are a pastor to patiently and gently and humbly bring the word of God in front of their people, both from the pulpit and the Lord's Day morning and corporate worship, and also in informal settings and um, dialogue with with the people and interact with them and try to convince them. And everyone, nobody has arrived. Nobody has arrived and understands every single thing perfectly. Not you, not me, not any other lay famous member of pastor, a church or a, any PhD. famous pastor or our own local pastors. Yep. They do not know all things and we don't either. Yes. So I think that is also something to encourage everyone, whether it be a pastor or a lay member or just another person in yes. life, that we're all, we are all being sanctified every day. So it shouldn't just be that the pastor is, oh, you know, meeting with the other person to just stick to their view. I'm, yep. This is what I believe. Right. So you just, you know, I just want to keep banging mm-hmm. in their head. But no, humbly get into the word yep. of God. What if he's wrong about something? Amen. Yep. It's not just the pastor is, you know, God. No, yes. no, no, Amen. no, no. Um, he's not God. Yep. So only the Bible is infallible. Amen. And, and so many pastors, you know, I've heard it many times. You know, uh, exhort their the people in their church to uh, maintain a teachable spirit, hmm. and that's good. Yep. We, we should all have a teachable yes. spirit. You yes. should, you know, be pastors should rightly exhort their, uh, the people to maintain a teachable spirit. Mm-hmm. But then do they have a teachable spirit? Yes. Are you preaching that to yourself? Amen. Or they're are you, members of the th- church too. They're members. They're that's, members of the that's church. That's their. That's that's first before yes. they're a pastor. Yep. They are a, a member, member of, of the God's church. Flock. Yes. Amen. You're a member of God's flock, and Christ is the shepherd. Amen. So yes, you should exhort the members of the church to have a teachable spirit, but you're not exempt from that. No. You need to have a teachable spirit also and recognize that you could be wrong. And many mm-hmm. pastors have shifted their views oh, from yes. when they're 25 to when yes. they're 65. Or, you know, even uh, theologians from of old would uh, issue, you know, before their death, they'd write a book called Retractions. Mm-hmm. And they would, you know, show kind of where things that they wrote were mm-hmm. wrong that they mm-hmm. had, you know, wrote before. And so we're, we're and all, how beautiful is that? It's, it's so, so humbling. humbling. It's so it is so yeah. encouraging. Yeah. And yeah. that, I think, is... Just what can stir on greater affection for Christ yes. when the pastor himself yep. is humbling himself right. and the Lord can get much glory yes. through that and encourage the the people of the church as well um, to have their views changed, to become more biblical. And, and there's a big problem and it should be massive yellow flags or maybe even red flags uh, and a sign of an egotistical pastor who always says to others to maintain this teachable spirit, but he himself does not have that teachable spirit. Mm, That is something to be on guard for because um, it's a sign that the pastor thinks of himself as the end all be all rather than the Bible as the end all be all. Yes. Yes. He, uh, a lot of pastors are uh, more learned in the the scriptures and Mm -hmm. how to interpret the scriptures Mm -hmm. than most of their, their church members. Certainly but that doesn't mean it's true for every single topic yes. and every single text. You could have a super learned pastor who is not nearly as studied on you know one specific theological issue mm-hmm. as a member in the churches. Mm-hmm. 
And um, so the, you really have to be careful that, you know, um, an egotistical pastor isn't trying to domineer over his flock by just, uh, you know, pretending or saying that he's the one who doesn't have to have a teachable spirit, but everyone mm-hmm. else does. Mm-hmm. So j- just remember that Christianity is a religion of persuasion of mind and heart by the spirit of God through the word. So if you don't like that someone holds to a certain viewpoint, then pray for him and try to persuade him or her why he's wrong. And then gently and kindly with much patience and much Hmm. grace, knowing that it's God who changes people's minds Mm -hmm. and hearts ultimately, gently and kindly interact with that person Mm -hmm. and get into the word with that person. So uh, that's that's the key thing that we're trying to communicate here. And mm-hmm. all of this has to come down to, you know, remembering the gospel mm-hmm. of grace, hmm. remembering the gospel grace that the Lord has given you. Do Amen. you have perfect viewpoints about everything? Hmm. And, and does the Lord silence you from learning? No. Hmm. Or does he, con- does he constantly call you to be like a Berean, like you mentioned before in, yes. in Acts 17, 11, searching the scriptures daily hmm. to have your mind renewed according to the word, Romans 12, 2. Mm-hmm. He, he's, the Lord is he's patient with you. He's gracious with you. So, so let's allow for open discussion, since none of us are glorified, and, and allow the Lord to direct people through his word, Amen. not try to keep God's people captive mm-hmm. by in a, in a cult-like manner, forbidding people from discussing the Bible with others and s- searching for truth with others. The Lord, like you said, is going to keep his sheep. Mm-hmm. The, the gospel and the truth are beautiful, and all Christians have the Holy Spirit of God, and we are called a holy priesthood. That's the, the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers mm-hmm. from 1 Peter 2.5. We, we can all be built up into maturity so we aren't tossed to and fro by unbiblical doctrines, Ephesians 4.14. And yes, pastors and teachers are a gift from God to, to help us. They are. But yes. we, should, we, we should respect what qualified pastors and teachers have to say, both modern-day pastors, the, the pastors of our local churches, if they're qualified and humble and truthful. And we should respect pastors and teachers from church history, for mm-hmm. sure, but they are not infallible, just like you said. They're not ultimate. The mm-hmm. Bible is. Yes. No. Amen. So when you are humble, when you are a humble leader who has been humbled by God, and you are about the glory of Christ and his kingdom, not your own glory, when you believe the gospel, you know it isn't all about you, and then you can relax, and you can entrust God's sheep to Christ. You can try to persuade people patiently through the word and pray that their minds would be changed and pray that your own would be conformed more and more to the word. Hmm. And you you don't have to try to manufacture this false unity through coercion or keeping people ignorant. Hmm. The gospel of grace, the, the gospel of liberty, really does create a culture of freedom of speech. Amen. Yes. And it's a beautiful thing. Praise Christ. Mm-hmm. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Gospel Liberty Podcast. 